everyone and welcome to another newscast. My name is Sam Healy and in this video we're going to tell you all of the latest news about our projects as well as the company. As always, if you don't want to watch the entire video, you can skip to the parts that interest you by utilizing the timestamps in the description below. This week we don't have any further information on Time of Legends Joan of Arc or Solomon Kane, but let's get to everything else. For Rikebusters today, we have another short update for the Errata Packs. The packs have cleared customs in the EU, and Meeple Logistics will start delivering them very soon. Quartermaster Logistics will be about two weeks behind them, however, since that boat arrived at port only this past Friday. So we do thank you for all of your patience. For Super Fantasy Brawl today, we'd like to address the issue of the storage solution, since there are several questions currently being asked about it. As you saw, in the Pledge Manager, you can find limited quantities of the Season 1 filled herd bag. This bag fits 15 champions, all game components, and the three statues. So this is a viable storage solution for traveling with the game. You can, in essence, pack up no less than three tournament draft teams. That being said, we also understand that this is not a solution that would help you store all the champions, and we did mention during the Kickstarter campaign that this is something that we are exploring and that we would provide more information concerning it during the Pledge Manager. Since telling you that, we have explored several options and examined their pros and cons. First and foremost, we would like to clarify that we will not be designing a storage solution to fit the big white box from the first campaign. The reasons that led us to this decision were many, but most importantly though, it's not something that would satisfy both new and old backers, as the new backers don't have access to the big wet box. Additionally, if we sent the trays with a, w without a firm box in which to package them, they would be very fragile and would most likely arrive broken, and we don't want to risk that. We thought to actually put them in the big white box, which would solve the issue of the access to the new backers, but this would mean that the returning backers would end up with two big boxes and would have to throw one away. We therefore decided that we will use a third-party contractor to create a global storage solution for us. After research and discussions with several parties, we decided to once again partner with Feldher for this. Our latest discussion with them was that they had finished 3D printing all of the Season 2 champions, and now that they have all models and components available, they'll start designing the storage solution. So as you can understand, the, the reason that we don't have a global storage solution on the Pledge Manager yet is because we don't want to put one up there for sale without having the actual storage designs to show you. We understand that the storage solution is of great importance, and it is something that we are going to do. As soon as we have designs, we will share them with you. However, we just can't guarantee that this will be done by the time the Pledge Manager is still open. If we're unable to show you those designs before the Pledge Manager closes, we will update you here for the designs and then put it up for pre-order in our eShop. We hope that you can understand why we haven't shown you anything yet. The Super Fantasy Brawl all-in storage solution is something that we want as much as you do, and we will make it available one way or another. We're as excited as you are to be able to offer this, and we want to make sure we get it 100% correct before we start getting pre-orders on it. This week for Enchanters, we'd like to share the latest information we've received for our Polish customers. First and foremost, we want to thank you again so much for your patience. As we've said, because of the very small number of these copies, we could not print them in our regular factory in China, so we had to move production into a smaller factory in Europe. Unfortunately, those smaller factories work in a much different way, which has resulted in all of these delays that we've been experiencing. We recently received some further information about this small print one, and we found out that the games will be produced in two months' time. We understand that this adds more to the already long delay, so we're prepared to offer you two options. Option one, we will open refunds again to all of our backers impacted by this small print run. So if those of you wish to cancel your pledge, you can email us at support at mythicgames.net and we'll offer you a full refund, no questions asked. 
Option number two, though, should those of you wish to keep your pledge, we'll be sending you a $20 coupon for our eShop as a thank you for your continued support and patience. We, of course, realize that this is not ideal and that you have already been waiting for a very long time. So we want you to know that this small print run has been very challenging, but we never abandon the efforts to see it through as we value all of our backers equally. It was a unique situation that taught us to avoid adding languages we can't support to their full extent and reach the minimum order quantity requested by our factory. We appreciate your patience with this and we certainly hope that the solutions we're able to offer exemplify this appreciation. For Steam Watchers today, as the factory churns out the games, here's a few additional tidbits of information we can give you on the product. A little while ago, there was some back and forth with the factory for one tiny and unforeseen reason, Brexit. The factory told us that the EU certifications did not suffice for our British Isles customers, so we got the UKCA certification and had to add it onto the boxes. That leads us to the box. The Steam Watchers core box is roughly 30 by 45 by 13 centimeters. This is about the size of the Super Fantasy Brawl white box you can see in Leo's live Q&As. Now, ideally, we would have wanted it a bit smaller, but the sheer number of components made that size appropriate. Remember, all seven clans have 16 miniatures, a dashboard, a wheel, and more. And that's without counting all the shared components, Archon cards, uh, Steam Column cards, Steam Columns, Farms, Turrets. And, in theory, all expansions should fit into the core box. So while this isn't as billowing as some of our other titles, Steam Watcher still packs a pretty big wallop, clocking in at no less than 350 plus miniatures. Please also note that setup and teardown are really fast, thanks to the trays that will be coming within that box. You just have to pull the trays from the selected clans to retrieve all the player-related components. For Hell the Last Saga this week, we want to continue with the second-to-last episode of the Artist Spotlight series. David Demeray is a freelance artist and art director and a veteran of science fiction and heroic fantasy design. Formerly, he worked in the video game industry for more than 20 years as a 2D and 3D graphic designer for games like Duke Nukem 3D, Alone in the Dark, Driver, Counter-Strike, and Legacy of Kane, just to name a few that we nerds will never forget. As a child, he was amazed by the reading of 21st Century Foss, an art book full of strange spaceships coming from the mind of Chris Foss. And then came Heavy Metal, an animated movie with visual shock from the magazine Metal Hurland. These references influenced him and motivated him to become an illustrator at all costs. After creating graphics for video games, David continued his career by also creating covers for science fiction books and metal band albums. As an avid RPG player since his teenage years, he was naturally inclined to find his way back into the board games with strong universes industry and was hired by Monolith and Mythic Games to participate in Mythic Battles Pantheon, which was the first of many major projects that David brought his specific touch to. His mastery of lighting and moods proved to be a great asset in bringing to life the fantastic environments he was asked to create. Since then, he's done game tiles for Batman Gotham City Chronicles, Claustrophobia 1643, both by Monolith, Gloomhaven Jaw of the Lion by Cephalofair Games, as well as troop and hero illustrations for Time of Legends Joan of Arc. 2020 has been a particularly prolific year for him since he has been working in parallel for Frosthaven, Mythic Battles Ragnarok, and of course, Hell the Last Saga. All projects that are marked by great cold and blizzard-laden landscapes. For Darkest Dungeon today, we previously talked about the Hamlet phase and questing. But today, we'll talk about a specific building in the Hamlet, the Blacksmith. 
The blacksmith is one of those elements of the game that had a big transformation during the translation from video game to board game. The initial idea for the blacksmith was to give a one-time boon, like a significant boost to dodge or something like that, that a hero can spend during one quest. This was something that worked fine mechanically, but just fine isn't good enough. We wanted an ability that would make the blacksmith yet another interesting option for the players during the Hamlet phase. As you can imagine, most of the ideas and suggestions we received during our demos and playtests, something that we really do appreciate uh, because all feedback is valuable, they all revolved around the idea of some kind of modifier, plus one accuracy, plus five maximum life, etc. These were possibilities that seemed like they could work, but again, we wanted to take our time to see if we could come up with something more substantial. Finally, last week, we came up with an idea that checks all the right boxes for us. So how does the blacksmith work? Well, to answer that, we first need to do a quick recap on skills. Each hero has seven skills, and all seven skills are available to you. You simply choose three of them at level one, or four at level two, and five at level three, as your active skills before you begin a quest. You can also level up any of those skills individually up to level 3, independent of your character's level. And every time you level up a skill, you simply remove the previous one from your pool of 7 skills. So, for example, you can be a level 2 hero and have a pool of 1 level 3 skill, 2 level 2 skills, and 4 level 1 skills. So, with that out of the way, we can finally talk about the new blacksmith. Now, when you visit the blacksmith during the Hamlet phase, you can now pay a price in order to choose one of your skills and use it at a higher level. Now, this level increase will last only for your next quest, but it is a significant boost, and it's also great for promoting experimentation with your hero, as you can try different skills and combinations before you invest your hard-earned experience points in gold in the guild to permanently increase the skill. We also feel that it's much more interesting than just a positive modifier to something. So that concludes today's update for Darkest Dungeon. We hope you enjoyed it, and we're looking forward to seeing your thoughts on our new blacksmith ability. Until next time, try to keep your stress low and your spirits high. Now remember that Leo will be live tomorrow at 6 p.m. GMT, 1 p.m. Eastern Time on our YouTube channel with a live Q&A in English and at 8.30 p.m. Paris Time with a live Q&A in French. So tune on in if you have any questions or if you just want to see what he might spoil. You know, he actually is getting pretty good about this. He doesn't spoil a whole lot, so... Let's give him some breathing room, because he usually does a pretty good job of it. Yeah. <laughs> but that's it for this week. Stay home, stay safe. Play some games while you're at it, and we'll see you on the flip side. Take care. Bye.